Okay, welcome back, everybody. Welcome to the penultimate lecture of uh, 228. We are going to continue on in a moment with our discussion of cyborg technology, but let's talk a little bit about our uh, final projects. Hopefully, your user testing went relatively well. Any unexpected interactions? There you go. Oh, that's it. That's the whole the, the magic of user testing, right? All those unexpected interactions. Hopefully you got some good feedback from your users, which you can incorporate into your final project, which you will be demonstrating here Tuesday, December the 10th. So next Tuesday, a week from now, I don't choose the times. We will be here at 7.30 in the morning. I will bring donuts and coffee, so there will be sugar and caffeine. Um, I will we'll talk about the particular schedule and the details of the final presentations uh, on Thursday morning. We'll go through exactly what's uh, expected, but just as a heads up, a reminder, you're going to be giving a presentation over a silent YouTube video. It will be either two minutes and 30 seconds or three minutes. Still haven't finished the schedule yet. We will stitch all of the videos together in a playlist, so which means you need to have your uh, video submitted in Blackboard the night before, so that Caitlin, the TA, can stitch all of the silent YouTube videos together in a playlist. We will start the playlist at 7.30 in the morning on Tuesday, and we will not stop the playlist until all the presentations uh, are done, uh, which will keep us on time, and we will probably finish a little bit before 10, 15, and you can carry on to your other final exams. All right, that's the big picture of what we're doing. On Thursday, we'll talk about the details. Any big picture questions about the final presentation? Yep? Maybe this isn't big picture, but what, what should we make sure to hit in the video? Because like two, two and a half minutes isn't that much. Time. Two minutes is not a lot of time at all. It is a big challenge to try and build in all the aspects of your project that we want you to touch upon. The details are in the final project uh, document, which you can find through any of these links. Uh, but I, we will also go over that in detail on Thursday. Question. Okay. Yes, that's why you can remove some of the functionality that was required in the deliverables and in the interim video. You're demonstrating your ideas in this two minute and 30 second video about what you've learned about HCI, what you built into your system, and demonstrating through your user testing what worked and what didn't work. Right. Another question. Yep. Um, I read through, like, the, the data that's fine. Yes, yeah, so for the students that are taking this course for graduate uh, testing, uh, graduate credit, you're doing this additional user testing with your 10 users, which hopefully is enough to get some quantitative data. On average, how long did it take your users to do X? What was the standard deviation of that interaction? You can go back uh, to some of the lectures we looked at in, on user testing and the design process where we talked about quantification and metrics. The mean of a, of a metric gives you some information, but the standard deviation also gives you a lot of useful information, such as why did some of your users such a, have a particularly hard time with that interaction, and why did some of your other users find that interaction particularly easy or intuitive, right? So it's up to you to decide what quantitative metrics you wanna show and your interpretation of what they mean in the final video for those taking the course for graduate credit. Any other questions? Okay, we'll go over the details uh, on Thursday. Okay, so back to uh, cyborg technology. This is obviously the last segment on our theme of looking inward where we as a species are getting better and better at mixing virtual and physical reality. We looked at VR and AR last time. We are now starting to embed technology inside the human body. And again, mixing physical reality, or in this case, human anatomy with artificial components. 
And in order to do so, we are usually building in these cybernetic components to bypass or augment, not unlike what we did with VR, which bypasses the real world, or AR, which augments the physical experience. We're either replacing or augmenting some specific component of human anatomy, such as a damaged sense organ, or an inability to send commands from the brain through the spinal column to various muscle groups. So we'll continue on uh, with part one, where we're mostly looking at the beginning here with cybernetic devices that are bypassing or augmenting damaged sense organs. So they are helping with the flow of signals that are coming from the outside world at the upstream point of capture, which could be the retina of the eye or the cochlea of the ear, the most upstream component, and then helping facilitate the downstream flow of that information into the brain. In some cases, we're gonna help with that process. In some cases, we are gonna jump over or bypass the sense organ altogether, right? We will then switch uh, at the end of this lecture and into the next lecture, looking at cybernetic technologies that replace or augment the motor system where commands are flowing from the brain down to the muscles. We may be in some cases like the locomot that we looked at last time, we're simply helping get signals from the brain to damage muscles, in this case, remembering how to walk. Or when we get to brain-computer interaction, skipping over the motor system altogether, capturing commands flowing downstream from the brain and sending them not to our arms or legs, but to uh, external devices like prosthetics or drones. Okay. Okay. So we looked at a few clinical applications last time to help rehabilitate getting commands from the brain to the motor system. And we ended last time by introducing the first uh, sensory cybernetic implant we're going to look at, which is the cochlear implant. This is, not, uh, this is not a hearing aid, which amplifies volume and supplies an amplified signal to a damaged but still partly functioning inner ear. The cochlea implants are for those that have a damaged or non-existent inner ear. And we are going to transduce pressure waves from outside the skull, so sound waves that are arriving at or near the ear. They're being captured by a pretty standard microphone and then transmitted wirelessly from outside the skull to a receiver, which is surgically implanted on the inside of the skull. So throughout uh, all of the sense, uh, implants, sense organ implants we're gonna look at in this lecture, we are looking for the point of transduction. So transduction is capturing some physical phenomenon, which in this case is pressure waves, and transducing them or altering them into a different physical phenomenon, which in most cases is going to be electrical current. Okay, so we're translating pressure waves into electrical current and we are sending that electrical signal into an electrode array. So if you look carefully at this image, you'll see there is a one dimensional string of beads which has been inlaid inside the spiral of the cochlea. And each quote unquote bead along the string is an electrode which is gonna take that electrical signal and stimulate or send, send out an electrical signal at that point. Different uh, electrical patterns are gonna stimulate different subsets of electrodes along this array, which stimulate the small hairs inside the fluid-filled canal of the spiral of the cochlea. In a functioning inner ear, we have uh, pressure waves that are arriving at the eardrum, and those pressure waves are vibrating different parts of the fluid inside the cochlea. So we've skipped over the inner ear, and we are trying as best we can with the cochlear implant to stimulate different parts of the cochlea, which then sends signals upstream from send signals upstream from the cochlea to the auditory cortex. So auditory, the hearing part of the brain, the brain that processes, uh, uh, processes incoming 
uh, auditory signals, and someone who has just been implanted with a cochlea implant hears something. The question is, what do they hear? Clearly, this transformation from pressurized waves into electrical signals arriving at the auditory cortex in the brain are different from what they experienced when they had an, uh, a functioning inner ear, or for most of us, what we would typically experience. So what exactly do they hear? Here's an example. Uh, and again, as you can imagine, for every patient or every subject that has a cochlear implant, they're going to hear something different for the same uh, sensory input, right? We are all different. And especially our particular pathways flowing from our sense organs to our brains are all wired slightly differently. So one cochlear implant does not fit all. Does the implant change the frequency you can hear at? Or is it still only wired to your brain to only hear certain frequencies? So does the brain hear certain frequencies? There are no frequencies here. There are frequencies at the microphone, right, which are captured and turned into some electrical signal. And that may be a combination of different frequencies of electrical current or electrical pattern. But it's very different from the actual frequencies captured by the microphone. The cochlea does not hear frequencies. It just different parts of the, of the cochlea vibrate given actual frequencies received by a functioning eardrum. This is something that's often difficult to wrap your, your mind around, no pun intended, which is the brain does not hear frequencies and it does not see photons or colors. What the brain receives are electrical patterns, which are some representation of external physical stimuli. So what exactly do people hear when they're implanted with a cochlear implant? I don't know if it's cheating, but I, I actually over Thanksgiving break, I went out there to get my small cousin's best helicopter. And, uh, okay. They don't, they're deaf, so okay. they don't really know the difference, but they had talked to somebody who was 40 that had one of these implants, and they said it sounded like everything was underwater. It sounded like everything was underwater. So you'll find if you speak to people who have cochlear implants, everybody's initial experience is different because they're all receiving more or less the same cochlear implant that is translating pressure waves into the same electrical current, but that is interpreted differently by everybody's uh, auditory pathways. Uh, I have a colleague who also has one of these, and he had one outfitted uh, uh, in, um, when he was middle-aged. And unfortunately, in his case, uh, what he heard was the loudest possible sound you could imagine. He said, imagine going to a heavy metal concert and sitting in front of one of, the, one of the big stacks. Multiply that by two. That's what he heard when he turned on his cochlear implant. And remember that this is not a hearing aid. So there is no volume knob to turn down. There was no way to turn down uh, the volume. He spent time uh, in his home until luckily after a few days, he started to acclimate to the incoming signal from the cochlear implant. So the good news about brains, aside from the fact they're all different, is that they also are able to adapt, right? Remember our discussion about building mental models and making predictions? Usually for most people that hear a very loud sound or it sounds like they're underwater, if they've had some experience with hearing before, the brain will usually adapt to try and normalize the incoming signal, the new incoming signal from the cochlea to more closely match the previous familiar signals arriving from the cochlea. The case is often very different when it's a very young child who doesn't know the difference. But again, the brain is trying its best to, to adapt. Okay, here is one person's experience of this rendered as best they could. Okay, so uh, not much to see here. You're gonna hear a series of auditory snippets, and each one is recording from more and more channels in this multi-electrode array. So what do they hear with basically a low resolution cochlear implant, and then a slightly higher resolution implant, and so on. 
You, the first snippet, you will definitely, what you're going to hear are speech sounds. You're going to hear someone actually talking. And in the first clip, it's not going to sound at all like somebody talking. See how many clips you need to listen to. It's going to be exactly the same piece of speech from the same speaker played over and over again. How many clips do you need to hear until you can recognize what is being said? How many figured it out after two plays? After three plays? Four plays? Takes a while, right? So again, you could see that they were adding channels here. So as, uh, as cybernetic implants and especially sense organ implants are improving, we're getting better at taking a very complex and rich pattern like pressure waves arriving from human speech and distributing them across an increasingly large electrode array so we can give the brain more high resolution input and basically give it more raw material to eventually adapt and be able to interpret the actual information that's embedded in the signal. Uh, theoretically, I, I'm, I'm wondering if they can change the microphone to hear another range of uh, sound, like uh, ultrasound. So you can change the microphone, right? You could, you could broaden the range of frequencies captured by the microphone, absolutely and provide that as input to the cochlea, yeah. which raises the same question of how would the brain interpret that additional information? How and whether it would. Assuming that this is an implant for someone who was able to hear before, mm -hmm. despite being able to hear, they were not able to hear ultrasound and infrared and whatever else. So it's a question, could it actually, if there's useful information in there, could the brain adapt to extract it? So in version one of the implant, when they just have the one channel, Correct. that would eventually become speech over time to the brain? It's hard to say. It depends on the person, right? So what they were trying to approximate in that first clip is imagine you have just a single channel, a single electrode, which is agitating one part of the cochlea. For that particular person, through self-reporting, telling the, uh, the other person what they heard, that is what they heard. They heard basically white noise, but they could hear the rhythm of speech. If you go back and watch this clip at your, at your leisure, you can actually hear that it is something like English or it is something like human speech. It's not music, it's, it's at least speech. Then the content of speech, that's, that's a little bit more difficult. Okay. So lots of different uh, approaches that are in uh, development at the moment. Um, aside from skipping over a damaged sense organ and supplying the signal higher upstream, more and more directly to the interpretation parts of the brain, we could instead try and shunt signals arriving at a functioning sense organ and use that to supplant or replace the non-functioning sense organ. So in this case, we're going to talk about the voice system. The voice system is designed for blind subjects, so non-functioning visual system. Instead, we're going to capture visual information. So they wear these uh, sunglasses, which have cameras uh, in them. They're capturing what the subject would normally see and take that visual signal and transduce it into an auditory signal and supply that to the functioning uh, ears. So uh, what they're going to try and do is take a visual signal and translate it into a soundscape. So we've spent some time in this course talking about visual metaphors. Now we're into auditory metaphors. Imagine that you are capturing, uh, you are capturing the subject's field of view and maybe downsampling it to low resolution grayscale. How would you take 
the grayscale values of the pixels and translate that into an auditory signal. There's lots of different ways you could do it, but we would like to try and pick a way that would make it easy for the brain to unpack that signal and maybe recognize the metaphor hidden in this soundscape. So uh, back in 2005, version one of voice, you can go have a look at the voice website. There's uh, a lot uh, much more recent versions, but in the early versions, they tried to preserve the spatial organization of what the subject was seeing and provide that along a sound spectrum. So objects that were in the left part of the subject's field of view, they would be louder through the left, uh, through the left speaker, and same thing with the right. Things that were brighter were louder, and pitch corresponded to things that were higher in the visual field and lower pitch to things that were lower in uh, the visual field, right? So three different sort of metaphors here. Okay. For some subjects, again, it, it differed for lots of different people, users who were able to see previously, so again, the, their brains have an experience with interpreting uh, uh, spatially organized uh, structures, they would actually form grayscale images in their head. They, could, they would report that they see a large bright colored object in their upper left visual field. Okay. Hard to kind of wrap your mind around what this would be like. So again, let's listen to a clip of the voice in action. So I'm going to play you this soundscape in a moment. And the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to play this video. And as you can see, there are uh, three objects on display here. I think there's actually a fourth object which is hidden at the moment. They're going to play a soundscape, a short clip of sound that corresponds to this particular scene. And then they're going to play a second clip when they remove one of the objects. So two of the objects are going to remain. One of the three is going to be removed. And one component of the, of the soundscape is also going to be removed. They're going to put that object back, remove another one of these three objects, play a third clip. The sound is going to be slightly different and so on. So far, so far, so good? Got the idea? Okay, you are gonna try and experience this by closing your eyes and guessing which of the three objects has been removed. Make sense? Okay, we'll do this a couple times. So go ahead and close your eyes. Okay, you can open your eyes. Which object was removed first? This is not unlike the video clip we just heard, right? It's like basically white noise. The top one? The fork? Okay, close your eyes, we'll do this one more time. Same clip. Okay, eyes open. Is it the fork? Why the fork? It would just sound like the top sound would disappear. Remember that things near the top of the visual field have higher pitch? Okay. Leave your eyes open. I've watched this clip hundreds of times. I still, I still can't do it. Not an easy thing, not an easy thing to do. Part of the reason why it may not be easy is because we're trying to do this consciously, right? This is probably one of those things you probably just learn by subconscious repetition. Okay. Okay. Let's keep going. We're going to push further and further upstream in the various sensory uh, pathways. So in this case, we're going to look at a retinal prosthetic. For those of you that wear regular prescription glasses or contact lenses, it's because something is up with the lenses of your eye, which remember is the most upstream point of capture, capture uh, for photons that are arriving at the eye. Assuming that your lens is just fine, but the retina, which sits at the back of your eye, is damaged, 
Doesn't matter how well your lens does at, fo at focusing light on the back of your eye, focusing light onto the retina. If the retina doesn't work, you're not gonna register any signal whatsoever, and you're blind. So in this case, we're gonna look at the MARC system, and this is just one of many retinal prosthetics at the moment. Yes? That's a, good, that's a great question. So the phenomenon of blind sight. So again, it depends on what particular damage has occurred to the retina. If the retina is able to pass any signal onto the optic nerve, which as the name implies, is a bundle of nerves that send signals from the retina to the back of the brain, which is where your visual cortex is. Most of the visual processing occurs in the back of the brain. If the retina is able to pass along signals, but it's passing along garbled signals, you get what's called blind sight. You see something, but it's not clear what that is. So uh, in both cases, uh, if you suffer from a damaged or non-functioning retina, some subjects can benefit from a retinal prosthetic where you either excise and remove the retina altogether and replace it with, yet again, a multi-electrode array. You now have a functioning lens or, or a camera that is focusing incoming light onto this, uh, on, onto this electrode array, and the electrode array passes electrical signals onto the optic uh, nerve. So back in uh, the early 2000s, when this was first starting out, uh, they did this with a 5x5 five five electrode uh, array, very, very low resolution. 2010, they were up to a 25x25 25 25, uh, array. Uh, back in 2013, the first retinal implant was actually uh, given US market approval. Given the UK regulatory uh, system, there's been a lot more progress on uh, clinical applications of retinal uh, implants. And the first bionic eye implant occurred in July 2015 in the UK. And we'll watch a short video of the subject that received this first implant. This is what the world looks like to Red Flynn. His central sight is gone, and he relies entirely on his peripheral vision. Ray told me it severely limits what he can do. Hi, Ray. Uh, I can't use the cash machines. I'd like to be able to go shopping and buy new things and do my own thing and then available. But they do pass the new one now. He does everything. I'm going to look at the back of you now. Ray has dry, age-related macular degeneration, AMD, which affects mainly the elderly and happens when cells in part of the retina become damaged. A few hours later, the surgical team at Manchester Royal Eye Hospital are ready to wrap this, the retinal implant, around the back of Ray's right eye, a world first for his condition. Age-related macular degeneration is the most common cause of sight loss in the developed world. At least half a million people in the UK are affected, so there is vast potential for any technology which can improve visual function and enhance quality of life. This is how it works. The patient wears special glasses, which have a built-in video camera. The visual information is wirelessly transmitted to the retinal implant on the eye. Electrodes stimulate the retina's remaining cells to send those visual signals to the brain to interpret. Two weeks after surgery, the key moment as the bionic eye is switched on. So please close your eyes. Ray is asked to keep his eyes closed during the test so the team can be sure whatever he sees must come from the implant relaying information from the camera on his glasses. Success. Vertical. Horizontal. Oh, it was wonderful. With my eyes closed, see the bars on there. It was really good. For his surgeon, it's highly significant. This provides hope to patients with not only this condition, but also to other patients with loss of central vision due to degenerative diseases. So this is just the beginning, and this could be uh, the beginning of a new era. 
Shin plants can't deliver fine visual detail like a human eye, but the technology is improving and trials like this are crucial to the development of bionic sight. Fergus Walsh, BBC News, Manchester. Okay, so bypassing the lens, bypassing the retina, capturing signals that are arriving at the cameras in this case and supplying them directly to the optic nerve. And as Ray reported here, he was able to at least distinguish between vertical lines and horizontal lines immediately after surgery. It'd be interesting to follow up on this experiment to see whether his, his visual acuity has, has improved despite the fact that his optic nerve is receiving a low resolution signal. Okay. So let's continue looking at visual bypasses that are bypassing more and more downstream components of the uh, optic system. In this case, we're gonna look at uh, this particular system where now we are going to implant uh, surgically a device at the back of the skull. It's a little difficult to see in this picture. We're looking at the patient from the back, uh, from the, from the back. Uh, and we are supplying the signal directly to the visual cortex now. We are skipping over the optic nerve altogether. One of the important things about both, uh, about all sensory pathways, visual pathway, auditory pathway, tactile pathway, is that as signals flow upstream from the point of capture to the brain, there is interpretation going on at all stages. It's not simply a matter of uh, the, the optic nerve passing along the signals received at the eye and letting the brain do all the work. There is partial interpretation all the way along. So it is particularly challenging if we have someone who has a damaged optic nerve because now we're skipping over the lens, the, uh, the retina, the optic nerve. We're losing a lot of the natural interpretation that the brain already does and supplying a very raw signal directly into the visual cortex. So it was amazing that this was done so uh, early on. In this particular case, again, cameras embedded uh, in the glasses are signal uh, capturing signals typically from where the eye would capture them, sending them directly into visual cortex. Uh, what exactly does the patient see? For most patients uh, that have had this surgery, they see phosphenes. So if you're ever out on a bright day and you close your eyes, you see those sort of blobs that are floating around on the back of your, your eyelids. That's what most people report uh, seeing. But however, with a fair bit of training, you can use some machine learning to arrange the relative position of these phosphenes that the subject is seeing so that the position of that phosphene in their mind's eye matches more or less major objects in their actual field of view. So if I see a lot of color, a lot of movement in the left side of my visual field, if I have this device, I might report seeing a phosphene in my right field of view. If we translate the signal, we alter the signal that's arriving to the visual cortex with some machine learning, and now I report that I'm seeing a phosphine in the left part of my mind's eye when there is a large blob of color or motion in the left part of my field of view, then we stop training of the machine learning algorithm, right? We're training the machine learning algorithm to place phosphines in the mind's eye where to correspond to other, to actual objects in the subject's field of view. Make sense? Okay. I apologize for the quality of this video, but again, this is an attempt to try and show you what uh, patients or subjects with this device actually see. Something right here, right here, right there, okay. Right in front of me, right in front of me. Now I passed him. Oh, now I got him. Now I have to blind. And that's a blind. Little break and the mannequin right here. Okay. One patient apparently was I able to very carefully drive and look 
from my left side to my right side, making sure I was between the little trees on the right and the building on the left. And when I got near um, any obstruction in the front, I would see that there was an obstruction. I would also see the lack of obstructions. And then when I backed up, I would be able to um, inspect for obstructions there. It was really a nice feeling. Okay. Don't know if this person is quite roadworthy, but pretty, pretty amazing, right? Okay. All right. Uh, obviously, some of these are, are early prototypes of uh, various sense organ prosthetics. This has come a long way. We're going to switch gears now and look at instead at motor cybernetic implants. We'll start with this particular one, remote uh, controlling uh, drones with your mind. This one is kind of interesting. Um, we'll just skip through the, the caption here, but you get the basic idea. You can see someone here is wearing an EEG cap, electroencephalography. An EEG cap allows you to pick up electrical activity on the surface of the brain. It's very difficult to pull out signals from the internals of the brain, but luckily, most of the motor signals are on the surface of the brain and they sit on a particular strip of the brain where if you were wearing headphones, where the strap would sit. We talked about this before. This is the motor strip. This is an example of what this looks like. And this is the motor homunculus placed on top of the motor strip. So this image here is showing the motor strip and the size of the various anatomical components here represent the sensitivity of motor commands being sent to those signals. So uh, you can experiment with your own motor strip by sitting quietly and imagining clenching your left fist as hard as you can without moving your left hand. If you do that, and if we had you in an fMRI machine, we would see the right side of your motor strip writing, lighting up very strongly, about midway down the right side, which corresponds to the motor homunculus's hand on this side of the brain, right side of the brain, which corresponds to the left hand. If you now imagine instead relaxing your left hand and clenching your right hand as hard as you can without actually doing it, if we were imaging your brain at this point, we would see this particular point in the motor strip lighting up. Turns out that if you put someone in an fMRI machine and ask them to actually clench their left hand or imagine clenching their left hand, as long as they don't move their head too much when they're actually clenching their left hand, it is very difficult by looking at the scan to know whether they were clenching their hand or thinking about clenching their hand. Yeah? Okay. So um, for BCI subjects, brain-computer interaction subjects that are paraplegic or quadriplegic, they can still, in many cases, imagine actions that they were able to perform before their injury. For example, they can imagine uh, clenching their left hand, which I think in this case sends uh, the drone to the left. If they imagine clenching their right fist, it sends the, the drone to the right, and so on. So they're imagining holding a joystick or holding a steering wheel and controlling uh, the drone, but in this case they don't actually need a steering wheel. Okay, imagine they clench their left uh, fist and we capture a signal from the right side of the brain, but again all subjects are slightly different, so the signals are going to be slightly different in the motor strip for different signals. So you imagine clenching your left fist, you expect that's going to tilt the drone to the left and it's going to start to move to the left but maybe it moves slower to the left or it moves forward and to the left. The drone is not doing what you expected it to do. The subject, while they are imagining these various motor commands, they are also watching a live video feed of the drone from the drone's perspective. And if the drone is not doing what they expect it to do, they, depending on their motor impairment, they say right or wrong, or uh, they give some signal back that the drone is not doing what they expect, which sends a signal to the machine learning algorithm, which is taking as input 
uh, EEG signals and sending as output commands to the drone and alters that input-output relationship a little bit. So now when the subject tries to repeat that action, now the drone does something differently. And if the drone actually moves to the left, when the person imagines, imagines clenching their left fist, no more changes to the machine learning algorithm. Right? So again, we're trying to tune up uh, the device in this case to match the expectations of the particular subject. OK. Uh, in this case, uh, rather, than, rather than trying to get signals directly, uh, indirectly from an EEG, it is now possible to, again, implant a multi-electrode array directly into the motor cortex. So we are getting this signal directly. And again, in this case, we're taking signals arriving at the array as input, which are motor commands. The subject is trying to imagine doing something. To think about that action, and then that resulting signal coming from the array is used to trigger some event, in this case, in software. Let's have a look at this one. Assuming you were training a subject to use this device, other than moving a cursor, how might you broaden the range of action for the subject? We could start with something like this, moving a cursor. But obviously, moving a cursor is not the only thing you might want to do. You could have them move something in three-dimensional space. Move something in three-dimensional space, right? So possibly create some simulation software with a three-dimensional uh, a three-dimensional uh, three world and imagine them and ask them to imagine doing what? Uh, possibly assuming that they have a functioning motor system in their in their arm absolutely let's think about uh, quadriplegics so no signals can be sent below uh, the neck for most quadriplegics so I, the example of going from 2d to 3d is a good one assume that this person was able to act naturally before the injury what would you ask them to do you could create a virtual ball floating inside a virtual 3D space on the screen in front of them, and they need to move that ball plus and minus x, plus and minus y, plus and minus z. And remember that we're going to have to capture signals from the motor strip to interpret which of those six commands they are trying to execute. What would you ask them to imagine doing? You need to pick some actions that are relatively intuitive for the users and relatively easy for us to pull out of uh, the motor cortex. Maybe uh, some hand gesture. Hand gesture for sure, right? Because the hand is very large in the motor strip. You can imagine not just clenching your fist, but closing your thumb, extending your index finger. You can, you, you can do very fine-grained motor imagery with the hand. And you can usually capture that pretty well from the motor cortex. So we're going to ask them to do something with their hand. What is it? We've got a virtual ball floating in 3D space. You could ask them to push it away from them. Push, maybe push the ball away from them, pull the ball towards them, move it to the left, right, up, and down. Right? You could imagine alternate uh, actions. You, you, could, you could imagine asking them to do that with their legs or moving it in some other way. There's different kinds of interactions we could create with this device. And again, we have particular HCI uh, challenges here. 
the usual ones, which is it's got to be something that's intuitive and easily learnable by the subject, but one that is also constrained by the constraints and opportunities of the motor cortex. Stephen Hawking's chair, was that just by his eye alone with a flinch, or did that actually go through his brain as well? In the case of uh, Professor Hawking's device, he had a series of devices over the years, and they became more sophisticated, but, ab but absolutely, it's responding to different muscle groups in the face. Okay, so we can imagine uh, asking somebody to move a cursor up and down and left and right on the screen. We could put a virtual ball in a virtual space and ask them to move that ball around in three-dimensional space. That all seems relatively familiar and easy if, again, before your injury, you are able to move things with your hands uh, and arms and legs. What happens if you put a subject in front of the screen with a virtual ball in a virtual three-dimensional space and you ask them to make the ball invisible? If I had a ball here in front of me and asked you to make it invisible, what would you do? At least for most of us, it's not immediately obvious what you would do. You can imagine coming up and grabbing the ball and hiding it from us, that works. Possibly closing your eyes. Let's assume I ask you to see the rest of the scene and make just the ball disappear. Could you like blink really hard with, um, I guess, stick the ball? The only thing you could control is like the liquid that comes in the room. Absolutely, right? So we could constrain ourselves to the motor strip and imagine actions like closing our eyes or blinking our eyes or coming up and grabbing the ball and hiding it. Or, of course, we could use magic and just make it disappear. We could leave the motor strip altogether and move to the front of the brain, which we haven't vi uh, visited yet, which is our species' particular forte. The prefrontal cortex is very good at imagining things that are beyond the motor strip. Let's go to the moon, for example. That's an action. Requires thinking about very abstract things like mathematics uh, and celestial mechanics and going beyond the nuts and bolts of grabbing and pushing and pulling. So imagine now, instead of capturing signals just from the motor strip, we're gonna go back to an EEG helmet in a moment, which is capturing signals from all over the surface of the brain, including the prefrontal cortex. And in the video we're gonna watch in a moment, they're going to ask the subject to perform familiar motor, motor, motor cortex-related actions like grab, pull, push, and so on. And then they're going to ask the subject to make things disappear. OK. So we're going to look at a particular device now. This is developed by uh, Emotive, or, uh, incorporated by uh, Tan Lee. If any of you were here last year, we actually invited uh, Miss Lee to come. And she gave a, a presentation and did a live demonstration with the provost, where he actually uh, wore this uh, device at the time. Uh, the provost was particularly successful at doing this for two reasons, and we'll talk about those two reasons after we watch the video. Experiences. 
And what better way to do this than by interpreting the signals naturally produced by our brain, our centre for control and experience? Well, it sounds like a pretty good idea, but this task, as Bruno mentioned, isn't an easy one for two main reasons. First, the detection algorithms. Our brain is made up of billions of active neurons, around 170,000 kilometres of combined axon length. When these neurons interact, the chemical reaction emits an electrical impulse which can be measured. The majority of our functional brain is distributed over the outer surface layer of the brain. And to increase the area that's available for mental capacity, the brain surface is highly folded. Now this cortical folding presents a significant challenge for interpreting surface electrical impulses. Each individual's cortex is folded differently, very much like a fingerprint. So even though a signal may come from the same functional part of the brain, by the time the structure has been folded, its physical location is very different between individuals, even identical twins. There is no longer any consistency in the surface signals. Our breakthrough was to create an algorithm that unfolds the cortex so that we can map the signals closer to its source and therefore making it capable of working across a mass population. The second challenge is the actual device for observing brain waves. EEG measurements typically involve a hairnet with an array of sensors, like the one that you can see here in the photo. A technician will put the electrodes onto the scalp using a conductive gel or paste, and usually after a procedure of preparing the scalp by light abrasion. Now this is quite time consuming and isn't the most comfortable process. And on top of that, these systems actually cost in the tens of thousands of dollars. So with that, I'd like to invite on stage Evan Grant, who was one of last year's speakers, who's kindly agreed to help me to demonstrate what we've been able to develop. So the device that you see is a 14-channel high-fidelity EEG acquisition system. It doesn't require any scalp preparation, no conductive gel or paste. It only takes a few minutes to put on and for the signals to settle. It's also wireless, so it gives you the freedom to move around. And uh, compared to the tens of thousands of dollars for a traditional EEG system, this headset only costs a few hundred dollars. Now onto the detection algorithms. So facial expressions, as I mentioned before, and emotional experiences are actually designed to work out of the box with some sensitivity adjustments available for personalization. But with the limited time we have available, I'd like to show you the cognitive suite, which is the ability for you to basically move virtual objects with your mind. Now, Evan is new to this system, so what we have to do first is uh, create a new profile for him. He's obviously not Joanne, so we'll add user, uh, Evan. Okay. So the first thing we need to do with the cognitive suite is to start with training a neutral signal. With neutral, there's nothing in particular that Evan needs to do. He just hangs out, is relaxed. And the idea is to establish a baseline or normal state for his brain, because every brain is different. It takes eight seconds to do that. And now that that's done, we can choose a movement-based action. So Evan, choose something that you can visualize clearly in your mind. Pull. Okay, so let's choose pull. So the idea here now is that Evan needs to imagine the object coming forward into the screen, and there's a progress bar that will scroll across the screen while he's doing that. Um, the first time, nothing will happen because the system has no idea how he thinks about pull. Uh, but maintain that thought for the entire duration of the eight seconds. So one, two, three, go. Okay. So once we accept this, the cube is live. So let's see if Evan can actually try and imagine pulling. Oh, good job! <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty amazing. 
So we have a little bit of time available. So I'm going to ask Evan to do a really difficult task. And this one is difficult because it's all about being able to visualize something that doesn't exist in our physical world. And this is disappear. So what you want to do, so at least with movement-based actions, we do that all the time, so you can visualize it. But with disappear, there's really no analogy. So Evan, what you want to do here is to imagine the cube slowly fading out, okay? Same sort of drill. So one, two, three. Oh my goodness, this is too good. <laughs> but we can see that it actually works, even though you can only hold it for a little bit of time. As I said, it's a very difficult um, process to imagine this. And the great thing about it is that the, we've only given the software one instance of how he thinks about disappear. Um, as, as there is a machine learning algorithm in this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's <laughs> awesome. Good job. Good job. Thank you, Evan. You're a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> example of the technology. So as you can see uh, before, there is a leveling system built into this software so that as Evan or any user becomes more familiar with the system, they can continue to add more and more detections so that the system begins to differentiate between different distinct thoughts. Um, and once you've trained up the detections, these thoughts can be assigned or mapped to any computing platform, application or device. So I'd like to show you a few examples because there are many possible applications for this new interface. In games and virtual worlds, for example, your facial expressions can naturally and intuitively be used to control an avatar or a virtual character. Obviously, you can experience the fantasy of magic and control the world with your mind. And also, colors, lighting, sound and effects can dynamically respond to your emotional state to heighten the experience that you're having in real time. Moving on to some applications developed by developers and researchers around the world. Uh, with robots and simple machines, for example, uh, in this case, flying a toy helicopter simply by thinking lift with your mind. The technology can also be applied to real world applications. In this example, a smart home. You know, from the user interface of the control system to uh, opening curtains or closing curtains. Also to the lighting, turning them on or off. And finally, to real life changing applications, such as being able to control an electric wheelchair. Uh, in this example, uh, facial expressions are mapped to the movement command. Now, right to go right. I'm going left, turn back left. Smile, we go straight. We're really open. Thank you. We are really only scratching the surface of what is possible today. And with the community's input and also with the involvement of developers and researchers from around the world, we hope that you can help us to shape where the technology goes from here. Thank you so much. Okay, let's start with the volunteer, Evan. Why did she choose Evan as her volunteer? He's, he's uh, her suitly uh, challenged, right? So think about some of the physical context that's at play around the emotive device. So she chose him for that reason. The electrodes can more directly connect 
uh, with the skin and get a better signal from the surface of the brain. As Ms. Lay was mentioning, one of the big challenges about interpreting signals coming from the motor strip or elsewhere on the surface of the brain is that it's highly folded or has cortical structure. Imagine training a machine learning algorithm to recognize a printed text on a sheet of paper. It's already challenging. Imagine you then took that sheet of paper and crumpled it so that at least all of the characters were still visible from the camera, but obviously very differently crumpled. And it should be able to read text off a crumpled piece of paper regardless of how that paper is crumpled because all of the cortical folds in human brains, they're all different. They're like our, our fingerprint. So some serious signal processing challenges here. So we want to try and get a good signal from the surface of the brain. So that helps if there's no hair in between. It was also why the provost was chosen as, uh, as the volunteer last year. But there's another even more important reason why Evan was chosen, aside from the fact that he's pursuitly challenged. He was already wearing the headset. He was already wearing the headset. She could have chosen anyone, obviously, to wear the headset before. There was a hint that was dropped in the video about why Evan was chosen. She mentioned it briefly just before he started. Not, he didn't work on a project before. He gave a talk at TED the year before. He was a former speaker. It's a pretty strong hint. Why would a former speaker, why would a former TED speaker be such a good volunteer? In that environment, if you've never like, given a presentation like that before, your brain's gonna be kind of all over the place. If you've like never stage, been on the TED stage uh, before, yeah. until this moment, your brain is gonna be all over the place? Why? What's the social and cultural context that's at play here? You're getting scared at by a lot of people. You're nervous. If you've ever looked at uh, someone who suffers from anxiety or is nervous in a brain imaging scan, it is literally all over the place. I was actually lucky uh, 10 years ago to see one of the very first demonstrations of one of these devices. It wasn't the emotive device. It was something similar. Uh, we were at a big event in Europe where they were unveiling some of this technology. Um, and I was sitting in the front row. There were about 1,000 people filing in. And while people were filing in, given where I was sitting in the audience, I could see hidden in the wings was a graduate student wearing an EEG device. And his instructions were to command a wheeled robot to come out in the center of the stage. The robot had a big set of scissors and it was meant to cut this ribbon and open this big European event. Uh, I was one of the later speakers, so I got there about an hour before, was sitting there, and they were doing dress rehearsals, and we watched this student command the robot three, four, five times to come out and cut the ribbon, no problem. They filed uh, all the tech people out, they filed in all the audience and the EU dignitaries, and everybody sat down, lights went uh, down, the music came up. What do you think happened? <laughs> nothing, absolutely nothing happened because the student was extremely nervous, had done this before. They'd done a lot of user testing, but not under the right conditions, right? Would have been great if they had an HCI member on their, their team. They didn't think carefully about the social consequences of this particular action. So like Evan, that's also the reason why they chose the provost. A university provost has a lot of experience talking and demonstrating in front of large groups of people. In order to use this device well, at least during a public demonstration, you have to be hirsutely challenged and be able to remain calm during the process. Okay, so obviously the push and pull of the cube, that makes, that's pretty straightforward. It's coming from the motor strip. Then she asked Evan to imagine making the object disappear. She did not give him any instructions about what particular action he should visualize to make it disappear. You can, of course, take a shortcut and just imagine the cube disappearing, which is presumably what Evan was doing. So aside from the fact that that's probably prefrontal cortex, the, imagine, the imagination part of the brain, the part of the brain that deals with abstract thought, but what particular aspect of, uh, of the brain or thinking is being uh, exploited here? 
We spent a lot of time in this course talking about feedback. It's not really an action that is being imagined here. What is being imagined? Remember our discussion about embodied cognition. I've mentioned this many, many times now. An embodied cognition, a human or an animal or a robot pushes against the world and then observes how the world pushes back. So again, thanks to our prefrontal cortex, you can imagine actions pushing something. You can imagine an action and the world's reaction. You can imagine pushing an object and see the object move far away from you. But again, thanks to the magic of the prefrontal cortex, you can skip over the action altogether and just imagine the sensory repercussion, which is the block moving away from you or a block gradually becoming less and less visible. Right? Your brain is imagining some hypothetical motor and sensory loop and sort of leaving out the details of the motor part of it and just imagining the sensory repercussion. And presumably, at least for Evan, whatever that imagination event was, it was relatively consistent from a EEG signal point of view that the emotive system could recognize that's Evan's pattern for imagining an object disappear and making the object actually disappear on the screen. Okay. Let's continue on now. We're going to move away from humans and into, in this case, uh, a particular animal. This is the lamprey uh, eel. We are now going to look at a cybernetic device, which again, we are going to now uh, skip over the motor system. We are also going to uh, skip over the animal's sensory system, and we are going to create a motor sensory feedback loop that passes partly through an animal and partly through an autonomous robot. Let's start with the robot. As you can see in the little cartoon here, this is a small hockey puck sized uh, robot which has two wheels and it's got two light sensors on the front, which should sound familiar to you. This is a physical version of a... Oh, it says right there, right? Yeah, exactly, okay. The Bradenburg vehicle. So the Bradenburg vehicle, we've got two sensors, two sensors and we've got two motors. So as the, as the robot is moving around in its environment, we're capturing in real time two light signals. We're taking those two light signals and passing them into the brain or the reticular formation, which is kind of the hind brain of the lamprey not unlike the, the, our hindbrain. And we're gonna feed that signal into the part of the reticular formation that usually uh, registers vestibular information or the amen, amount of orientation of the animal. So in this case, as you can see in the lamprey, as it's swimming through the water, if it happens to tilt to its left, it can register that uh, tilt through its vestibular sense and give a flick of its tail and right itself, and the same thing if it tilts to the right. However, in this case, we are uh, just taking the reticular formation, not the animal itself, but just this, this anatomical uh, structure, passing these two light signals into where the intact animal would usually receive vestibular information. That signal then flows through the sensory to the motor part of the reticular formation. And the signals in the motor part of the reticular formation, in this case, would usually be sent to the animal's tail to flick left or right. But in this case, we are capturing those motor signals. There is no tail. Taking the motor signals and sending them back to the two wheels of the robot. So I don't know if this is an animal or a robot, something in between. So now we're taking light stimulation from the left sensor and sending it to the left part of the sensory system in the reticular formation and getting strong signals back from, if there's more signals coming back from the left part of the motor system in the reticular formation, the left wheel spins faster. If there is more electrical activity in the right-hand side of the motor subsystem of the reticular formation, 
We spin the right wheel faster. Given all that I've just told you, which uh, Breitenberg vehicle does this instantiate? A little tricky to figure this one out, right? Okay, wired together positively, so more stimulation in the right sensor means a faster turning left wheel, vice versa. Possibly. There, you probably need some more physiological detail, right? So what are the two vestibular organs in the lamprey doing? If the lamprey tilts to the left, does that mean there's more electrical signal in the left-hand sensory organ than there is in the right? It's not immediately clear. Uh, depending on how you wire this up, you get vehicle 2A, the uh, vehicle 2A or 2B. One is the aggressor and one is the coward. I forget which one it is. But same sort of idea here, right? The animal tips to its left and it flicks its tail to the left to right itself. A very simple sensor motor circuit in a relatively simple animal that you can co-opt to instantiate that behavior in a robot. It's not immediately obvious what the practical application is of this, but simply that we can co-opt or combine, again, more intimately than anything we've seen up to this point, closing the sensor motor feedback loop where part of this loop is going through an organism and part is going through a machine. Okay. Last one we're gonna look at in this series is we are now going to take individual neurons uh, from a rat in this case. We're gonna take these individual neurons and place them on top of a multi-electrode array. Again, so we've got a whole bunch of these multi, uh, a whole bunch of these electrodes over a two-dimensional plate in this case. And given the right conditions and the right uh, nutrients, the neurons will send out uh, synapses and connect with its neighbors, neighboring neurons, and also connect electrically with the electrodes that they are sitting on top of. So now we have an interesting cybernetic system where we have a bunch of electrodes. The electrodes can provide electrical stimulation to the neurons sitting on top of them. The neurons can electrically stimulate their neighbors and also electrically stimulate the electrodes underneath them. We can then uh, connect this two-dimensional plate electrically to, again, uh, a, a simple two-wheeled, two-sensor robot. And in this case, what the, uh, what the investigators found when they did this, in this neuron-controlled robot, is they asked the question, could we start with a desired behavior, which is that the neuron-controlled robot is going to follow another robot, the second robot is going to be remote controlled by the investigators. Can we use or somehow train the brain of the uh, neuron controlled robot to exhibit this desired behavior? In this particular plating, what they found is that there were two, they, they found two particular electrodes distant from one another. And when they stimulated those two electrodes with electricity, but supplied that electricity at different time intervals, so they'd stimulate one electrode and then the other, depending on uh, the delay between those two signals, they could elicit a particular neural response. So if the delay between the two stimulations was greater than 150 milliseconds, they got a medium neural response, an average, a medium average resp response from neurons that were at or near those two electrodes. If the delay in stimulation was about 150 milliseconds, they would get a low average neural response. And if the uh, delay was less than 150 signal, uh, milliseconds, a very high response from the neurons. If you took a second multi-electrode array and seeded it with another set of neurons, you'd probably get a completely different behavior. But on this plate, with these neurons, over the course of a few hours and a few days, this particular pattern was pretty robust. 
So they use that to control the robot. So in this case, we have the following robot, the uh, neuron-controlled robot. It's sending out an infrared pulse, not unlike what's in your Leap Motion device in front of it. And if there is a long delay between the emitted infrared pulse and the reflection, that long uh, delay would be supplied to these two electrodes. So the time at which the pulse was sent out and the time at which the pulse was received, which would lead to a medium response from the neurons. So that mean response, the overall activity of the neurons was just sent to the wheels, which meant that the wheels turned at medium speed and it would just drive forward. If the following robot was close behind the leading robot, there would be a short delay. Uh, there would be a short delay between the following and the leading robot, which led to a short delay in the electrical signal supplied to the distant pair of electrodes, which gives a high response. Uh, and the high response was interpreted as reverse. So they were again using a machine learning algorithm, or I'm guessing in this case, they probably tuned this manually. High response meant reverse the wheels or slow down and stop. And then if the robot was following at a desired distance from the lead robot, then the delay in the IR pulse and the sensed reflection was about 150 milliseconds. Lowest response, stay still. If the following robot starts to uh, move ahead, the following robot would drive forward. And by a little bit of tuning, they could get this cybernetic device to follow the lead robot. Again, not immediately obvious what the killer app is here, but that we can, in this case, bypass all the uh, upstream and downstream normal flows in an organism from retina or inner ear to the brain and back and create a very intimate connection between biological material and artificial material. Thursday, we will continue this and look at directly interfacing artificial devices with biological materials. You have a quiz due tonight. Uh, you have no interim video to work on, either than your final project. And I will see you on Thursday. Thank you.